Uh, thank you so much for coming to our Crash Course in the Force panel, the Star Wars 101. I'm Pablo Hidalgo from Lucasfilm. I hope you're having a great D23. Uh, you know, I kind of feel the need that, to get this out of the way right at the top because there is so much intense speculation and intense anticipation when it comes to the future of Star Wars that I kind of want to be upfront about what this panel entails. People are dying to hear any information about what's coming up next. So, I can reveal to you today that that's not what this panel is about. Oh, right. <laughs> really Later! <laughs> Let's pause for all the bloggers to make their way out of the... No, if you got your smartphones out right now and you're live tweeting this, or you've got an editor waiting uh, with bated breath to find out new information, you can just relax for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Because we, this is really more about a retrospective history of Star Wars. And then we're going to open up for 20 minutes of Q&A, and who knows what's going to happen there, so, you know, something might come out. Um, now, this is about 36 years of where Star Wars has been. When Disney asked us at Lucasfilm to, uh, to come and do a panel, we thought, hey, it'd be a great opportunity to bring Disney fans up to speed on what Star Wars fans already know. But I have a sneaking suspicion that we have Star Wars fans here in the audience already. <laughs> you'll learn something as well because you might know some of this stuff but we'll, we'll do our best and um, and really I, I want to thank all the Disney fans thank you for welcoming us into the world of Disney fandom uh, there's a lot of natural crossover and, and I think it's going to be a, a great combination um, all right so what is Star Wars about that's a tough question to answer and you could slice that many different ways so I'm going to start off talking about characters see if this works. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> Star Wars is about Jedi Knights, guardians of peace and justice, an ancient order that also wield the coolest weapon known to the galaxy, the lightsaber. Do we have any lightsabers in the audience here that we can see? There we go, we got a few here. Good, good, good. <laughs> no red ones though, we're talking about Jedi first. Um, so they, they're uh, guardians of peace and justice who could tap into a super mystical, supernatural mystical field called the Force to create supernatural abilities. And uh, they follow an ancient order, they follow an ancient code, they're guardians of peace and justice. They protected the Republic for thousands of years until they were betrayed by a dark conspiracy that branded them traitors and they were wiped out. And now the Jedi are all but extinct. Who was responsible for that? That one on the right. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Sith Lords. Do we have any red lightsabers in the audience? Oh, there we go. We have a Sith Lord over there. We don't know where. So the Sith Lords, they're also uh, an ancient order. They also use lightsabers, like that red one over there. And they also tap into the Force, but they tap into its dark side, fueled by anger, fear, aggression, hatred. These are bad folks. Yes, thank you. <laughs> but a thousand years ago, they ruled the galaxy by force. But the thing is about Sith Lords is they really, they're not, they're not team players. They constantly conspire against each other for power. They're constantly fighting. And the Jedi took advantage of that at the time and were able to wipe them out. And for the longest time, the Jedi thought the Sith were extinct. But a couple did survive. And they realized, you know, guys, we keep losing because we keep fighting each other. So they decided, from now on, there's only going to be a couple of us. We're going to work in the shadows. And that ha happened from generation to generation that allowed them to build this conspiracy that destroyed the Jedi. And what the Sith Lords created was the Empire. The Sith created a galactic empire. They replaced the peaceful democracy of the Republic with a totalitarian, oppressive government of the galactic empire. And these, <laughs> we've got Woo! a very sinister individual here applauding. Appreciate the tyranny. Way to go, sir. Um, <laughs> so the Imperials are basically these jackbooted thugs who have at their disposal fleets of warships, armies of troopers. They even constructed a battle station capable, well, actually a couple of battle stations, we get right down to it, <laughs> capable of destroying entire planets. These are the villains. And we, what happened with the Empire resulted in... It's a, a trap! 
And a rebellion rose up to challenge the empire and attempt to uh, rebuild the republic that the empire replaced. And, and these people come from a wide variety of cultures and backgrounds, united by a hope to instill freedom back in the galaxy. And uh, even though they're ridiculously outnumbered, they've got hope on their side. Star Wars is about soldiers. You, got, you can't have a war story without soldiers. So these are the warriors of Star Wars. They may be native soldiers defending their home turf, or they could be clone troopers bred in a high-tech laboratory for combat, or they could be mechanical soldiers that know no fear, no mercy, or actually they don't know much. These guys are pretty dim-witted. Right <laughs> Star Wars is also about, let's see if we get the next one. Here we go, nobles. These are influential, high-ranking individuals, senators, royalty, trade barons. They're able to inspire millions. They sometimes do so for good, trying to help people who can't help themselves, and they sometimes do so for bad. They're just greedy individuals, megalomaniacal, nasty people, and, but they do dress well, so we gotta do that. Yeah. <laughs> then on the flip side of the noble coin, you've got uh, scoundrels. <laughs> And these are bounty hunters, gangsters, smugglers, gamblers. Hello, what have we here? We've got gamblers. These are folks, honestly, they could care less about the intergalactic battle of Sith Lords and Jedi Knights, of light side and dark side. These guys are just trying to survive. They're trying to make a buck. They're trying to make the most of their lives in the shady underworld. And sometimes they do this by dint of their deadly skills, their connections their luck or their dashing good looks. Uh, yeah. that's sort of <laughs> and then finally, we've got sidekicks. <laughs> and these are characters that may not have all the skills that our heroes do, but they are loyal, they're devoted, and they will do their all to help out in the cause. Whether or not they are really primed and, and excited about adventure, or if they're absolutely fearful in dread combat. So the six films of the Star Wars movie uh, saga tell the story of all these characters. And they tell the stories, ultimately, about how an individual can change the course of history. And how an individual can change the lives of millions of people for good or for bad. The Star Wars stories manage to tell tales that are personal and small in scale but also galactic in scope. It's a story of individuals and their relationships, and also the rise and fall of civilizations. There's no real way to summarize all these movies in a presentation. I'm gonna give it a shot, but really, if you haven't seen them, the best way to experience Star Wars is to watch the movies. So I could have cut this presentation short right now and just say, oh, just go watch the movies. But there, there yeah. more to come. Um, <laughs> so a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, let's start with episode one. Phantom Menace. And episode one is about a young boy named Anakin Skywalker, a slave boy who shows remarkable potential in the Force. He can snatch glimpses of the future, he shows wisdom beyond his age, and he has incredible pilot ability, piloting ability. But in order for him to reach his destiny, he has to make the difficult choice of leaving his mother behind in order to fulfill his future as a Jedi Knight. But it's also the story of a corrupt republic and an ambitious politician by the name of Palpatine who takes advantage of that in order to rise in power. It's the story also of a young queen, Amidala, who has to defend her home planet from a sudden and mysterious invasion. And it's also the story of the Jedi Knights discovering that the Sith Lords were not as extinct as they thought. So episode one, you'll see, manages both a personal story and a galactic story, which is a pattern that continues throughout the Star Wars saga. Fast forward 10 years, we're on episode two, Attack the Clones. Anakin Skywalker, the toe-headed little boy that we just saw, is now a 19-year-old Jedi apprentice, full of promise. But he strains against his vows to the Jedi Order when he's given a mission to protect Senator Padme Amidala, who he is deeply in love with. And at the same time, he also struggles with his dark temper when he comes to discover the terrible fate that befell his mother in his absence. On the galactic scale, episode two 
is about Palpatine, who's now Chancellor, his Galactic Republic straining under a separatist crisis that threatens to split the galaxy in two. And the Jedi Knights, on an unrelated investigation, suddenly discover, hey, conveniently, there's a clone army ready for them to use, which is great because the galaxy erupts into war when the Separatists and the Republic fight. It's the first war the galaxy has faced in a thousand years. After a few years of combat, we move on to Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the, of the Sith. Oh, that's, a, that's, that's I'm usually able to say that much easier. Revenge of the Sith, and that's about now Anakin Skywalker and his mentor Obi-Wan Kenobi are war heroes. They're brothers in arms. But when Anakin is plagued by visions of his beloved Padme in danger, he makes a deal with the devil, essentially, that plunges him into darkness and into a fateful confrontation with his old friend. On the galactic scale, we have a war-weary republic and its leader, Palpatine, who refuses to relinquish war powers, even though the war has ended, when confronted by the Jedi Knights, and what he does instead is brand the Jedi Knights to be traitors of the Republic, orders them to be executed, and replaces the Republic with a galactic empire in the name of peace, justice, and freedom. Yeah. So fast forward a generation, that's the events of Episode 3, moves us into Episode 4, A New Hope, which for many of us is actually the first one. <laughs> Luke Skywalker, a farm boy growing up on a dusty desert planet. He wants more out of life than moisture farming. I can't imagine that moisture farming sounds really appealing, but he wants more. And uh, his mentor, who happens to be Obi-Wan Kenobi, introduces him into the ways of the Force. He reveals to Luke that his father was a Jedi Knight. And Luke follows his conscience and, conscience and leaves the farm and instead becomes a fighter pilot in service of the Rebel Alliance that's fighting the Empire. It's also about the Empire unveiling its awesome battle station, the Death Star that can destroy planets, and the Empire's most sinister agent, Darth Vader, who is tasked with stopping Princess Leia's rebels from using stolen data plans to attack the Death Star in hopes of finding its weakness. That's episode four. Move forward a few years to episode five, the Empire Strikes Back, which I imagine is a favorite of many. <laughs> Luke is now a rebel leader, and he also follows his destiny to learn the ways of the Force, to study, to become a Jedi Knight under the last remaining Jedi Master, the wise Yoda. But when Luke is plagued by visions of his friends in danger, he rushes off to save them and instead goes headlong into a confrontation with Darth Vader where he learns a horrible, shocking truth about the Dark Lord that amazingly I'm not going to reveal here. For the two or three of you who don't know it and somehow managed to not see it at our Anatomy Evolution of a Villain booth, I'm actually keeping this a secret, believe it or not. <laughs> And on a galactic front, it's no surprise the Empire Strikes Back is about the Empire striking back. They attack the rebels, send them scattering to the wilds of the galaxy, and hire uh, in, and then hire criminal bounty hunters from the underworld to track them down. So that's Empire. That brings us to Episode Six: Return of the Jedi. Now Luke is now a Jedi Knight, and he rescues his friends from the clutches of the criminal underworld. He also discovers finally the full truth about his mysterious past, and he decides to take it upon himself to attempt to redeem Darth Vader from the dark side of the Force. He, Return of the Jedi is also about the Empire unveiling its second Death Star, even more powerful than the first, and luring the Rebels into a confrontation both on ground and in space for a battle that will decide the fate of the galaxy. There we go. That's everything that happens in the Star Wars song. <laughs> yeah. But it's more, and Star Wars fans will tell you, it's more about what happens. It's how the stories are told. The Star Wars saga, the six films, are told with exquisite detail and texture. The stories are set in a universe that, are very, that is very convincing. You can believe that it's real, that it has history, it's lived in, it's alive, and it's a place that you want to revisit again and again. The Star Wars saga is also told through amazing visual effects. Let's catch it.
catch up with me here. Here we go. Mind-blowing visuals that push the envelope of what's possible with cinematic technology and inspire storytellers everywhere to think big, to think beyond the boundaries of any, uh, uh, any boundaries that technology might place on your imagination because you're able to visualize things that you've never seen before. Star Wars also manages to tell its tale through kinetic, high-speed action sequences. Um, exquisitely edited for maximum impact. Everything in Star Wars is faster and more intense, from uh, high-speed action sequences to narrow escapes. Another trademark of the Star Wars films is that they have mythic moments. They're steeped with symbolism and archetypes that reach back into our collective history as storytellers and inspire us and touch us in profound ways. Star Wars is not science fiction. It's space fantasy, and even better, it's been described as space opera. But it's not so uh, deep and mythic and powerful to not be accessible. Star Wars is also about human characters with human emotions, human relationships. It's stuff that we can relate to, friendship, camaraderie, love. And also, Star Wars is about, well, Star Wars isn't afraid to have fun. <laughs> In addition to telling deep stories and sometimes dark stories, it finds humor in character, in circumstance, and sometimes in the most unexpected places. <laughs> so all this sprang from the imagination of one man, George Lucas. And this is him on the set of the first Star Wars movie. And he would have been 32 at the time, so anyone who's older than 32, let that sink in. <laughs> Uh, you know, as a filmmaker, he started off doing some very edgy, non-traditional, experimental stuff. But when it came to making Star Wars, he decided to make a very accessible story. And he was just concerned with making it as entertaining as cinematically possible. If, for those who don't know, the filmscape, the film landscape in the 1970s was filled with a lot of grim, gritty, dark material. Great movies, but you wouldn't exactly consider them escapism, especially not for a young audience. Um, George wanted to do a movie that was the kind of movie that he grew up with, uh, all filled with adventure and optimism. To be honest, the kind of movies that Walt Disney was known for. And at the time, in the 70s, the Disney company was actually not making those types of movies. To hear George tell it, he wanted to create a modern fairy tale for a generation that was growing up without fairy tales. And uh, to do so, he recruited a lot of talent. Way too many people that I can possibly name in the presentation this brief, but I do want to draw attention to a couple of them, uh, including Ralph McQuarrie. <laughs> Ralph McQuarrie was a concept artist and illustrator, and George hired him to help visualize his movie, to help illustrate exactly what he was looking for, especially as a tool of communication. George hired Ralph to do illustrations so that he could communicate these outlandish and never before seen ideas to other people, actors, uh, cast, especially studio executives who couldn't make heads or tail of what George was, was working on. So Ralph's art really established the language of Star Wars and established its scale and its sweep. Another artist I want to draw attention to is uh, Joe Johnston. And Joe was at the time a, uh, he was hired on as a visual effects art director. And what he ended up doing throughout the original trilogy is he took George, uh, Ralph's often elegant designs and ruggedized them. He made them more real and, and created a cinematic reality to the images. And uh, the thing that's interesting about Star Wars that I can't say enough about is for, this, for the generation that was exposed to Star Wars, it made clear that film, films were designed. Films were designed by artists. The artwork developed by folks by, like uh, Joe and Ralph would then be reinterpreted by other departments, be they costume designers, makeup artists, alien effects artists, set decorators, prop builders. And all that art made its way into art of books that folks like me and, and many other people saw as a young age and were inspired. We found those art of books as inspiring and exciting as the films themselves. 
So let's see what we got next. Oh yeah, I wanted to show this slide. This is, uh, <laughs> okay, what we're looking at here is an audience full of people. I don't think it's as big as this audience. But it's an audience full of people getting their first look at Star Wars. This is Comic-Con, believe it or not, in 1976. <laughs> and the reason I wanted to bring this is because Lucasfilm has valued fandom from the start. It's, it's recognized the power of fans. As we were leading into the launch of Star Wars, uh, they did the convention circuit in the summer of 1976, going to science fiction conventions, comic book conventions, fantasy conventions, you name it, and trying to tell the world about this movie that's coming out. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, here we go. We got Roy Thomas and Howard Chaykin. Yeah. These were the guys who were responsible for the Marvel Comics adaptation of Star Wars, so at least it made sense for a movie to be at Comic-Con back in the day, because uh, these were the guys <laughs> tasked with doing the comic adaptation. The artwork that's behind them is uh, actually from the very first Star Wars poster that was available to collect during that summer of 76. About a thousand were printed, and they brought some to Comic-Con. They sold them for a buck a piece. Most went unsold. And looking at eBay earlier today, they are currently being auctioned for about $3,000 a piece. <laughs> so there's a lesson in there. <laughs> But the thing about going to conventions is that's what was required to get people excited about Star Wars and to ensure that there would be lines wrapped around the block when the movie opened on May 25th, 1977. And it's really hard to imagine what a different world it was back then. Um, Star Wars, when it opened, only opened on 32 screens across the entire US. 32 theaters. And uh, it was a different world. Uh, at the time you were expected, you could expect the movie to stay in theaters for months instead of weeks. You didn't have that thing that you have now where you could go, you know what, I'm going to skip that. I'll see it when it comes on DVD or Netflix by the end of the year. You couldn't do that back then. And what happened, which doesn't happen now, nowadays movies open in thousands of theaters at the time and then they get whittled down as more and more stuff comes out. Back then, movies opened small, relatively, 32 screens, and then word of mouth spread. More and more people got excited about Star Wars, more theaters would book them. But if it wasn't for the fans who went there in the first place on day one, that word of mouth never would have happened. So Star Wars, Lucasfilm, and fandom have been, have been in, like, importantly connected from day one. Also, what you couldn't really do back in the day, or I guess you still do it to this day, if you wanted to experience Star Wars outside of the theater, uh, you, you had limited options. Um, you know, it didn't necessarily always come with all the merchandise and stuff that comes out of the game to begin with. If you wanted to continue the adventure, you could have picked up the Star Wars novelization or the Star Wars comic adaptation that was at the time. The funny thing about this is the novel came out six months before the movie came out, which is crazy to think about now. You could have read the entirety of the Star Wars story in December of 1976 before the movie came out. And the comics adaptation actually started in March, three months before the movie came out. Why was that? Because Star Wars was an unknown commodity. This was all in the interest of hoping to inspire people to come see the movie. Uh, and it worked, obviously. But uh, the novelization went on selling like five million copies in print. The comics adaptation, Stan Lee has gone on record to say that the Star Wars comics single-handedly saved Marvel from what was going to be a very dismal year of comic sales. The other thing you take for granted nowadays is that if you like a movie, you go buy the action figures, you go buy the toys. No one expected the intensity and appreciation and excitement that Star Wars generated including Kenner Products, the company that Lucasfilm had partnered to make toys. They did not have any toys ready for the release of the movie and not even for the Christmas season of 77, the holiday season. So kids who wanted to buy Star Wars action figures would instead buy this. <laughs> Kenner actually sold an empty box at stores. Imagine you're a kid at Christmas and you're unwrapping a box hoping to get Star Wars toys and what you get instead is this cardboard box. And you open it up and there's like, no, nah, there's stuff in there. It's like, you, gotta, you join the space club, which means absolutely nothing. Uh, but you got like an action figure stand, which to me is almost like even more insulting. <laughs> but you do get a mail-away certificate that promises you 
the first four Star Wars action figures, quote, as soon as they're ready. And they were ready. They came out in February of 1978. So patient kids had to wait that long to get their first toys. But again, it's one of these things you just take for granted. And of course there's toys for a movie. Who would know it? And the merchandise for Star Wars really redefined uh, merchandising for movies. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of collectors here who, who, who could testify to this, is that, you know, before Star Wars, um, the only films that really had any success in terms of merchandise were Disney films. A live action sci-fi movie was not expected to be that collectible, but Star Wars redefined that. So that brings us to, that's, that's the era of the original trilogy. And for those who are not up to speed, yes, it is confusing. That is episode four, five, and six. We started at episode four. So 1977, the original Star Wars, directed by George Lucas. 1980, The Empire Strikes Back, directed by Irvin Kirshner from George Lucas' story. Yeah. And episode six, Return of the Jedi, which came out in 1983, directed by Richard Marquand. These movies redefine blockbuster success as far as movies go. Uh, before that, there had been Jaws in 1975, which was like regarded as the first big summer movie. But many people thought it was a fluke. The thing that we kind of take for granted now is that summer was not generally regarded as the big movie season. Summer is when you go to the lake, you go to the cabin, you don't go to theaters unless uh, you're looking for air conditioning. It's, it wasn't like the big movie season. The big movies were for the fall. But Jaws came out in the summer and like everyone went and saw it. Star Wars came out in May and everyone went and saw it. And because of it, Star Wars defined Memorial Day weekend, May 25th, as the target date for the summer blockbuster season. It's finally moved earlier from that, <laughs> thanks to movies like Spider-Man and The Avengers, but for the longest time, May 25th was the start of the summer season. The other thing that the Star Wars movies did and I'm gonna, let's see, I'm gonna come up with an, an analogy that I haven't really thought through, so bear with me. Um, you, you, you know how when people talk about the space race of the 50s and 60s, and they say that it resulted in all these other technologies that didn't necessarily have to do with the space race, but it uh, affected consumers and stuff like that, Velcro, microwaves, you name it. Star Wars was kind of similar in that, in order to make Star Wars, uh, George Lucas invested in a lot of technologies, that would then benefit filmmaking and entertainment as a whole. As an example, he, he couldn't find a visual effects facility to make Star Wars, so he had to create the visual effects facility to begin with. And they continued to push the envelope and what was capable, what everyone was capable to create visuals on film, and it continues to this day, and that's industrial light and magic. And for visual effects, George also uh, created a company called Skywalker Sound. And they were tasked to finally revolutionize post-production, editing, sound design, sound mixing. And in this way, Star Wars literally changed the way films are made because the investments that George made uh, finally brought filmmaking processes that honestly had not changed fundamentally since 1920 into the electronic and ultimately the digital realm. I imagine since we got a room full of Disney fans, uh, someone here can identify what this is. <laughs> Anyone know? Yeah. yeah, so this is a, uh, a still from an animated short called The Adventures of Andre and Wally B. And it was an experimental film that came out in 1984, animated by John Lasser, and created by the Lucasfilm Computer Graphics Group. And that name didn't last for long because the Lucasfilm Computer Graphics Group was soon renamed Pixar. And the Computer Graphics Group started off in Star Wars. They started off trying to find ways to use computers to create imagery in movies. And the holographic effects for the Rebel briefing scene in Return of the Jedi was done by the Computer Graphics Group. And they realized that the potential, there was more potential than just holograms. You could actually tell stories with computer-generated imagery. So that brings us to about the 1980s. And um, Star Wars had changed the world, but it was not endless. George Lucas was quite candid in describing just how exhausting the process was of making the first three movies. And he wanted to take a break from the uh, galaxy far, far away. Now there were a few related projects here and then. 
uh, including uh, a couple of live action Ewok TV movies that aired on ABC in 1984 and 1985 that starred the Ewoks and uh, Wilford Brimley, a natural combination. <laughs> And for kids in the 80s, you know, kids who grew up, I'm sure I'm not alone in this, a lot of us hold these movies in a special place in our heart. But we have to be honest, they, they really can't compare to the scale, sweep, and success of the Star Wars films. Uh, you know, internationally, these were released in the theater. They, they were released in the U.S., they only aired on TV, but in Europe, they, they, they appeared in, in theaters, and I can only imagine the... Uh, surprise of people thinking they're going to see the next Star Wars movie and they instead get the Ewok image. <laughs> also around that time, the characters of R2 and C-3PO continued adventures on Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, and it, they were a lot of fun, but it only lasted 13 episodes. Probably. Ewoks outlasted them a little bit more. <laughs> they had two seasons of Ewoks. I'm sure a lot of you can sing the theme song if I put you on the spot, but I'm not going to do that. Well, again, a lot of good fun, but again, it did not have the kind of worldwide success that Star Wars had. Not even Ewoks on Ice could capture that. <laughs> it was a very weird period after the original trilogy. Um, Star Wars would show up in odd places, including the uh, George Lucas Super Live Adventure. This was a distinctly Japanese stage show. <laughs> that appeared in the early 90s, that tried to combine the most uncombinable films of George Lucas's career. We got Star Wars, we got Indiana Jones, we got American Graffiti, Willow, Tucker, and they put it all into an amazing musical stage spectacular. <laughs> that is the scene sense. Do a clip. I would, you know. <laughs> now, not all the combinations of this era proved uh, misguided. Uh, some of them were, were natural combinations that ended up having real enduring power. Yeah. 1987 saw Star Tours open in Disneyland, and uh, it was the first real collaboration of, uh, with Star Wars and Disney. Um, and it was, honestly, it was the last hurrah of the original Star Wars era. It, the ride included amazing visual effects from Industrial Light and Magic and an awesome experience from, from Disney Imagineering that for the first time really made it possible to live a Star Wars adventure unlike ever before. But that was it. After 1987, it got really quiet. Um, the comics stopped publishing, there were no Star Wars novels, the toys stopped selling, and even though George had said during the heyday of the original trilogy that there were more Star Wars stories yet to tell, it was clear that he moved on to other projects. So it was quiet. But then little things started to happen. One of the other projects that George moved on to was a TV series called The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. Yeah. <laughs> And that aired on ABC in the early 90s. And what George wanted to do with that show was to bring to life the early 20th century in a way that really you had not seen on TV before. You would experience what life was like in 1910 and World War I in the 1920s. But because he was also bankrolling the production, he wanted to do that on budget. So he began experimenting with digital technology. And he found that using basic tools like Photoshop, he was able to extend a back lot into a believable 1920s cityscape. Or he could turn a single platoon of French World War I soldiers, or sorry, a single squad of French World War I soldiers into an entire platoon with digital replication. So he started experimenting with these filmmaking tools, and the real groundbreaker actually was in 1993 when Jurassic Park came out. And George was very closely involved in the post-production of Jurassic Park, directed by his good friend Steven Spielberg, produced by Kathleen Kennedy, remember that name? <laughs> and uh, for Jurassic Park, ILM really just redefined what was capable with visual effects. Their lifelike dinosaurs that were entirely computer-generated said to George that what had previously been thought as unthinkable was now thinkable. He was able to find a way now to visualize things that he didn't think were possible on film. 
And while this was happening in the world of film and television production, Star Wars fans were slowly starting to get re-engaged. It was quiet at first. Yeah. Yeah. But in 1991, Dark Horse Comics and Bantam Books began the first new Star Wars storytelling in years. Dark Horse published Dark Empire by Tom Beach and Cam Kennedy, and uh, Bantam published Heir to the Empire, the first book in a three-book cycle by Timothy Zahn. And the books were an amazing success. They were top sellers. Heir to the Empire, I think, stayed on the New York Times bestseller list for something like 14 weeks. It was clear that there was an appetite for storytelling, and these works set the foundation for more storytelling, what we call the expanded universe of stories beyond what happens in the films. Uh, Dark Horse, the comics world, was particularly intrepid. Uh, they would go beyond what was known in the movies and went all the way back to the ancient past of Star Wars storytelling, telling tales set thousands of years before the events of A New Hope when the Jedi were in their prime. They even went further into the future telling stories a century after the events of Return of the Jedi. And as far as books goes, an entire library of Star Wars books resulted in the following years. Uh, so much so that we have to publish guidebooks to help you make heads or tails of the entire expanded universe. The other thing that happened in the 90s is that the promise of Star Wars video games... You know, actually, I want to stop on this for a second, because this reminds me of something. When, um, when Disney and Lucasfilm came together, there were a lot of stories in the news about, uh, or at least there was one big story in the news, about how this meant that Disney was now had access to over 25,000 years of storytelling and over 17,000 characters. That's where that, those figures come from, from the vast library of Star Wars storytelling. And uh, I am one of the people involved at the company that helps keep track of all this stuff. So uh, it's a good job if you could get it. <laughs> anyway, I was about to go on to video games. The 90s saw the potential of Star Wars video games finally you know, reach uh, what we all dreamed was possible. We had video games before that. You know, in the 80s, you could go to an arcade or you could throw a cartridge into your Atari and maybe play one or two levels of a Star Wars action sequence. But it wasn't until 1991's Star Wars for the Nintendo Entertainment System that you could actually finally experience a whole Star Wars movie, a whole Star Wars story as a playable experience. And that was just the start of it. Since then, an entire legacy of Star Wars video gaming has come up that allows you to play epic, mythic, important stories in the history of the Star Wars universe, allows you to fulfill your wish to be a Jedi Knight, to be a pilot, basically to do anything you can imagine in the Star Wars universe. All this stuff in the 90s was leading towards a specific event, and that was 1997's 20th anniversary of Star Wars, and its theatrical re-release as the Star Wars Trilogy Special Edition. Entertainment Weekly called this re-release one of the biggest gambles of 1997, which kind of strikes me as funny now, but there is some reasoning behind that, and it was this. Even though there were fans who were buying comics, buying video games, buying novels, that was largely invisible to pop culture at large. These fans, as far as the, the general mainstream world was convinced, Star Wars was dead. No one had talked about it in ages. And but before it disappeared, it had managed to sell millions and millions of copies of home video, I mean, laser discs, VHS, beta tapes. Kids, ask your parents what those are. <laughs> or visit a museum. Um, but the thinking was this, would anyone go to pay to see a 20-year-old movie if it was accessible on home video or on TV or on a rental or any of that stuff? And people had doubts, but George, George figured that seeing Star Wars on the big screen was worth it, and he was right. Thousands and thousands of people went to see the special edition trilogy. And the also thing about this trilogy was that it allowed George to it gave him a test bed for new filmmaking technologies that he was going to be employing in the creation of the next Star Wars trilogy, episodes one, two, and three. So he went into the original movies and completed sequences that he had never finished before and also, uh, well, let's just say modified visual effects that, uh, <laughs> that it never pleased him the first time around. And that sparked debate online from fans who, you know, were discussing the merits of it all. The debate that continues to this day. But the point about that, yes, on shot first is that
But the point about that debate was that it was happening online. The return of Star Wars in the 90s was accompanied by the rise of the internet. And here, through the magic of Netscape Navigator technology, <laughs> I bring you the very first Star Wars website, the official website back, that launched in November of 1996. And this was just one of hundreds of websites that was uh, on the internet devoted to discussing what Star Wars was about. So what had happened is the return of Star Wars to the mainstream also came when fans were discovering that there were all these communities around the world that they could be part of and they could discuss what's happening with Star Wars. The real modern age of Star Wars fans started in the 90s. And these fans are awesome. They are devoted, they're creative. They take the time to express their love of Star Wars with awesome creativity and talent, like creating costumes that you know, rival or even surpass those that are seen in the film. Uh, one particular example I actually want to draw attention to are the R2 builders. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these guys are amazing. Uh, they devote themselves. They're smart, tech-savvy fans who build their own R2 units. And uh, we marvel at them because they build droids that are far more capable than anything that we have ever built for the creation of the original trilogy. George often laments how awful it was to work with R2-D2 because uh, the mechanics involved in making the droid work back in the day, they just simply didn't work. They would have to work around them, they'd have to cheat it. You'd build, one, you'd build a bunch of droids, each one capable of maybe doing one thing, and if you were lucky, you'd get that on film. What the R2 builders managed to do is they build one droid that can do everything that R2 does in the films and more, and it's, it's absolutely amazing. And so while fans were connecting to each other in the early 90s through the internet and whatnot, they were also connecting to Lucasfilm. And as I said before, Star Wars and fans, Lucasfilm has always had a great relationship with fans. Starting in 1999, we started hosting parties for them, official conventions called Star Wars Celebration. Here's a shot of You guys have been to a celebration? So we've had, I think, nine of them so far, including the last one was just a couple of weeks ago in Germany, where we had 20,000 fans attend. And that's what these things are. It's an awesome party of Star Wars fans that brings out tens of thousands of individuals. Um, for celebration, we create multiple days of programming that showcases what we have in the works, but more importantly, we put fans in the spotlights themselves. We turn the programming over to fans. They create workshops, activities, and attractions. Celebrations were so successful, in fact, that the organizers of the first D23 Expo actually met with our fan relations and events people at Lucasfilm to find out, well, what do you guys put into a celebration that makes it work so well? And I can't talk about fan and fan events without mentioning the 501st Legion. And this is someone who the 501st. The 501st are a costuming group devoted to um, dressing up as, as Imperial characters, mostly stormtroopers, but also officers and type fighter pilots and everything. They started in 1997 when founder Alvin Johnson and a friend of his decided to dress up as stormtroopers for the uh, special edition theatrical release. And they have since grown to thousands of members worldwide. And they're awesome. They operate independent of Lucasfilm, but we are always humbled by the work that they do. They are fantastic ambassadors. They do amazing work at children's hospitals where they just bring Star Wars to life for, for the kids who are, who are at those hospitals. One of the biggest admirers of the 501st is George Lucas himself. And on the 30th anniversary of Star Wars, he arranged for 200 members of the 501st to, uh, from around the world to accompany him as he was Grand Marshal of the Rose Parade. And this is uh, a photo of that event. And we've got 200 stormtroopers and we've also got, in Imperial uniforms, members of the Grambling State University High Stepping Marching Band. It was, it was an amazing sight to see. But George was a huge fan of the Final Four, so we can't say enough about them. So, the thing about fandom now that arose in the 90s is it was proven to be a really a multi-generational thing. Men and women who grew up with the original Star Wars trilogy introduced their children to it and wanted their children to be Star Wars fans. And even kids who were too young to watch the movies know Star Wars through the various expressions, whether it be Hasbro action figures, or Lego Star Wars, or more recently, Angry Birds Star Wars. All these things. <laughs> kids know, they know the characters, and it's great because what happens is they get the, the, the foundation there and then it becomes an almost sacred rite of passage 
uh, when the parents decide to introduce them to the Star Wars saga. Um, if you look on YouTube, there are videos that parents take of their children to capture their reactions uh, when they watch the movies. It's pretty amazing. So for this young generation, for a lot of them, and also for everyone, the prequel trilogy became their Star Wars. And much like the original trilogy, these three films had lasting uh, effects on the industry. Episode 1 came out in 1999, Episode 2 in 2002, Episode 3 in 2005, all directed by George Lucas. I could cite multiple examples of how they changed things. Uh, just off the top of my head for Episode 1, Episode 1 redefined what a movie trailer could be, it made an event out of a movie trailer. Uh, it was the fall of 1998 when the first Star Wars trailer was going to come out, and Lucasfilm went out of its way to let fans know what movies would be playing the Star Wars trailer, and fans flocked to those films. I remember in my particular neighborhood, the theaters had to put up signs saying that there will be no refunds for Waterboy or Meet Joe Black. <laughs> because what was happening is people would pay ticket price, go with, sit in the theater, watch the trailers, and then leave asking for a refund. <laughs> it was also the biggest internet event at the time when the episode one trailer uh, went online. It, it, it surpassed the two biggest, <laughs> the two biggest previous events was uh, one of the Mars landings and the Kenneth Star Report. And, uh, Kids, ask your parents what that is. <laughs> but the trailer surpassed all of that. And in fact, it drew such attention that Apple went to Lucasfilm and said, hey, you know, the next time you guys do a trailer, we'll help you out. We'll put it off on quick time. It'll look so much better. And that started the tradition that continues to this day. When you want to see what the latest trailer is, you often go to the Apple site, the, the quick time to find out what the latest is. Uh, 2002, episode two, it's landmark effect on the industry was it was the first major film of its scale to be shot entirely without film, shot with digital video. And George had been an advocate of that for the longest time. He had hit the limitations of what film was capable of, and for these kinds of movies that he was making, it made absolute sense to do, do it from top to bottom, keeping it in the digital realm. It was unusual at the time, and now it's extremely commonplace, especially for visual effects intensive films. Episode three really pushed the envelope on digital exhibition. Uh, at the time, there might have been you know, 20, 25, 30 digital theaters that you could see it in, and now digital theaters are much more common. Uh, you actually, you, you, you'll be able to find them more readily than, than traditional film projection theaters. But, unlike what happened with the original trilogy, George was not exhausted <laughs> after the prequel trilogy came out. He wanted to do more, and to do more, he founded a company called Lucasfilm Animation. He decided that he's going to create an animated series unlike ever seen before that continues to tell Star Wars stories set between episodes two and three. And to do so, he hired one man by the name of Dave Filoni, who is the supervising director of the Clone Wars. And I mention Dave specifically because he is a Star Wars fan, and that's one of the things that I keep wanting to impress upon you about Lucasfilm and Star Wars. We hire fans because they offer a unique perspective, and Dave definitely did so in creating stories for the Clone Wars. The Clone Wars series told untold tales of the galactic war that shook the, shook the Republic and put Jedi Knights in the front lines defending the galaxy. It told the tale of young Ahsoka Tano, a Jedi apprentice, Yes, big fan of Ahsoka myself. Who learns her place in the galactic conflict and grows through the run of the series? It puts soldiers of the Clone Army into the forefront. Before Clone Wars, these guys were just anonymous characters. After the Clone Wars series, they were heroes. And what's great about this is it often told stories about a unit called the 501st, named after the fan group itself. It deepened the mythology about Jedi Knights and characters and that's our Jedi Knights and the Force. It created new villains and resurrected some old ones in a rather memorable style. And more so than that, it did all this with an animation style that was unlike anything seen on television. You were literally getting a 22 minute Star Wars movie every week. The Clone Wars has recently ended its broadcast run with over 100 episodes. That's over 40 hours of additional Star Wars storytelling from George Lucas. And there are more stories yet to come on this front. So that's bringing us into the modern age. And, um, you know, if you look back in the 80s, there's evidence of people who wanted to play in the Star Wars universe and wanted to make it part of their experience. Um, 
they, but they, they just, it wasn't that, on, it wasn't that common. You probably counted on your, on your fingers and toes. But there are a few memorable examples like this. <laughs> but you compare that to the modern age, and you can't basically turn your head without seeing Star Wars infusing its way into everyday life. Whether it be as uh, Mr. Potato Head mashup as Darth Tater, or whether it be Seth MacFarlane and the guys having fun with Star Wars, or Seth Green and Matt Sederick having fun with Robot Chicken, <laughs> or next year, as you'll see, when Phineas and Ferb have their have their Star Wars. But the point is, the line between pop culture and culture has essentially blurred. Star Wars is part of the culture. Also in this post-movie era, I gotta say, especially for this audience here, Star Tours returned. <laughs> and had a long overview update with new adventures and new plans to visit. And as we now know, especially with the even closer relationship between Lucasfilm and Disney Imagineering, this is just the beginning. <laughs> so, George Lucas had talked retirement for a long time, but he never really got into specifics until May of last year, when he named Kathleen Kennedy as his successor to run Lucasfilm. And she is an amazing filmmaking talent. She's got over 60 films to her credits, including such landmark movies as E.T., Jurassic Park, the Back to the Future films, Indiana Jones. No one said it specifically at the time, but it was pretty easy to read between the lines. You do not hire so active a filmmaker without thinking of a future of active filmmaking. And that became clear in October when word got out that George had signed a deal that brought him his friend Star Wars as part of the Disney family. And with that deal came the announcement of a new trilogy of Star Wars film. Well, it's more than that. It's a whole slate of entertainment. It's new movies, new television, new games, new attractions. Kathleen Kennedy began assembling a brain trust of talent to shepherd the future of Star Wars. So the first new entertainment that's going to come out of the gate is a yeah. brand new series called Star Wars Rides. And that's coming to Disney XD in the fall of uh, next year. And um, it brings Star Wars back, back to its roots of scrappy underdogs fighting against an overwhelming Imperial foe. Dave Filoni from The Clone Wars is serving as an executive producer alongside Greg Wiseman and Simon Kimberd. And then in 2015, actually before I move on, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing this right now, this is me pretending to have an earpiece. <laughs> we have pins related to Star Wars Rebels available at the Evolution of Darth Vader attraction uh, floor exhibit after this event. So, if you want to get a Rebels pin, Please go there and pick one up. Now, that brings us to 2015, and what comes next is the movie that everyone is asking us to get information about. <laughs> What's it called? But this man is standing over my shoulder to make sure I don't say anything. <laughs> no, I know, we're all dying to talk about Star Wars Episode 7, but we're not there, we can't talk yet. We, we can reveal what's been said. I mean, Michael Arndt is the screenwriter for it, you know him from Toy Story 3 and Lord Sunshine, and he's working in consultation with screenwriters Lawrence Kasdan and Simon Kimberg. J.J. Abrams is directing it, and it was recently revealed at Celebration that John Williams, maestro himself, is returning <laughs> I was. At one point, this slide was just the Star Wars logo with Episode 7 written under it, and then I thought, oh my god, I can just imagine the headlines, Lucasfilm reveals at D23 the official Star Wars Episode 7 logo. So, I decided I'll play it safe and show it JJ instead. <laughs> so that pretty much brings us up to speed now, and I know a lot of you, especially if, if you're new to Star Wars, may be asking me, well, what do you need to know before Episode 7 comes out in order for you to enjoy it? And honestly, you don't even know anything. You could go in cold, not knowing a thing about Star Wars, and still enjoy it as an awesome movie. But it does build on this amazing 36-year legacy by people who know and love Star Wars inside and out, and for fans who have been there since day one. So it's going to be a return to a favorite place, as well as a chance for all new discoveries. And it's just the start. There's going to be Episode 8, Episode 9, and other standalone films that exist outside this trilogy. So that brings us up to date, and I am now going to open this up to questions. We've got some microphones somewhere that the stage crew will point you towards. 
Uh, and I will do my best to answer your questions, but please understand that I may have to skillfully evade them because there's a lot about the future that I can't quite discuss. It. So are we all set to go? Let's start right here, sir. Hi. Um, any word on the remaining season six of The Clone Wars? Yes. Uh, might be reviewed? We have uh, a good question. For those who don't know, when season five ended off Clone Wars and ended its broadcast run, but there were additional episodes in production. We are working to get those out to an audience. Um, it's a mix of complete episodes and incomplete episodes. They're, they're actually being worked on as we speak and finished up. And our folks in distribution are thinking outside the box and finding ways to get it. And so we, we have not branded them as season six because it's not a full season of episodes. But I'll say this much, it's, more, it's probably more than you think. And uh, we don't have that plan in place just yet, but it's coming close. And uh, the second that's cemented, it'll be revealed on StarWars.com. We've shown some bits of it, and if you go to StarWars.com, you'll be able to see a couple of clips from the upcoming episodes. Some amazing stuff coming up. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Right here, Princess. Hello. Um, I, along with I'm sure many other Star Wars fans, may have noticed that the movies that I originally watched when I was a kid that got me into Star Wars have little differences now that they're on DVD. So my question is, do you know if Disney is going to ever re-release the unedited versions that don't have the changes that are different? than what we remember watching originally? There's definitely an interest in that, and I, I'm gonna watch me skillfully answer this. Um, <laughs> if you ask George Lucas, his definition of what the Star Wars movies are are the latest iteration that was available. And that's what he's interested in presenting to the public as, as, uh, as what represents this film. Well, when I say that, I want to put an asterisk on that and, and that say, and say never say never. Because if you had asked George two years ago, he probably would have said, well, there will never be an episode seven. <laughs> and now here we are with episode seven on its way. So there are no plans, but um, anything can happen. Thank so. you. I, I won't even tackle about the episode seven question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, pertaining to uh, Star Wars Rebels, though, what time period will that take place in? So Rebels takes place between Episode 3 and Episode 4. So it's before the events of New Hope. So basically the Galactic Empire is in power, it's, it's, it's authoritative, it's an awful place to be in, and there are people who are willing to fight it. And that's, that's what I can tell you. Will there be uh, any other stories of Jedi or placed in there? Or? Well, I'll say this much. The Jedi in this era are all but extinct. As you know, there's only a couple that are in hiding, but their influence is over the galaxy, and I would not be surprised that, I mean, they cast a long shadow, so uh, I, think, I think you'll see the presence of Jedi in one way or another in the series. Thank you. Thanks. I, that was just my question. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so what I'll ask now is, um, with all the projects that were up and running before Disney acquired Star Wars, and they kind of like uh, fell off the earth, like um, Star Wars Detour that Seth Green was doing. Mm -hmm. Any of those projects, are they going to come back in any way, or did they bite the dust? No. What what happened was those those projects started off with before Episode Seven was ever a reality, and Episode Seven required a reality check across the board to say when's the right time to do projects like that. And it turns out it's we didn't, you know the the powers that be decided a comedy series would not be the right lead-in as we go into this new future of Star Wars storytelling. But that doesn't say, I mean, the work is, is, is fundamentally done on a lot of it. That doesn't mean that it's off the, the face of the earth altogether. When the time is right, we'll, we'll look for the best way to make that uh, content available. Thank you, and no Jar Jar. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, let me, let me write that one down. <laughs> no hyphen. Uh, this way. Since no one's asked it yet, um, in any of the future movies, either Episode 7 or the spin-offs, will we see Mara Jade or Janiah so uh, Solo? That gets into talking about the content of future movies, and I'm afraid I can't answer that. But is it something you want to see? Oh, yeah. Okay, all right. I'll make a note of that. <laughs> yes. Hi. 
I was wondering if there's any talk of bringing Star Wars Weekends to Disneyland. As opposed to just Disney World, because there's a lot of people in California that would like to have Star Wars Weekends. I'm not involved in this discussion, but I've heard that sentiment expressed, and I have a feeling that Disneyland will, will its Star Wars presence is only going to increase. So, yeah. And I've been given the mark that we have one last question, so, sorry. I, I went longer than I thought it would. Yes, sir. Um, quick question. You mentioned the uh, Star Wars The Adventures Continue, uh, and that being only the beginning. <laughs> Can you extrapolate on that? Is there anyone from Imagineering here who would Nobody's like to tackle right. this question? Uh, <laughs> oh, I wish I could answer that, but I cannot. <laughs> uh, harass anyone from an Imagineering that you managed to run across, and hopefully maybe you can twist their arm and get something from them. All right, thanks. Sorry. That is the conclusion. I want to thank you all for coming. I have a to catch, so thanks for coming, and may the force be with you.